You recall we left off in Genesis chapter 2. The creation of Eve. And note, ladies, that what? Adam was created on the sixth day. Then God rested. And after an unknown amount of time, perhaps many, many decades, in the Garden of Eden alone, God saw it was not good that Adam would be left alone. So he created Eve. Think about this, ladies. Eve was the last masterpiece he created. Gentlemen, she was the cherry on top of the sunlight. The masterpiece of God's creation. Can I get another amen on that? Amen. Think about that, ladies. You are indeed special. Eve was the heart, you would say, of the garden. If Adam was the head, created first, Adam was formed first, Eve was the heart of the garden. Eve was beautiful in every way. She was witty, intelligent, kind, and innocent. And Adam and Eve, at the end of Genesis chapter 2, were living in paradise. Paradise. We don't know how long it was that they lived in paradise. Indeed, in a world to explore, a blessing of all creation at their control. The whole animal kingdom was submissive to them. And God said what? Fill the earth and subdue it. Adam and Eve lived in paradise. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the first three words of that verse says what? Now the serpent. How long they lived without the serpent in the garden, we do not know. We can speculate it wasn't very long because they had no children. They had no children. So it was probably a short amount of time. They lived in the garden, in this paradise. But the serpent entered. The serpent was more cunning, the Bible says, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So we need to pause here and stop and say, who was this serpent? I cannot spend as much time as what I want to on this. And our knowledge is limited. But we do know this. The serpent that tempted Eve was indeed the serpent of old. Satan, the devil. Why do we know this? Because numerous times in the book of Revelation, he is referred to as the serpent of old. And the Lord Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8 that he was a murderer from the beginning. <coughs> so the Lord Jesus Christ attributed the temptation of Eve to the devil. The serpent. However, we see here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, he was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And I don't want to steal my thunder from a future message, but I do want you to look very briefly at verse 14 of Genesis chapter 3. When the curse, when God cursed the serpent in Genesis 3, 14, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So we do know this, that the literal physical serpent that God created was involved in this temptation. We don't know all that we want to know about this, but we do know that God cursed the literal physical serpent as well as Satan himself in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. If you want to know more about that verse, stay tuned. That's going to be covered in the weeks ahead. However, we cannot understand fully the relationship that the serpent of old Satan had with the physical serpent. But we can know that God held the physical serpent he created, the beast of the field, so to speak, responsible for allowing, allowing Satan to use him to tempt Eve. They had some kind of cooperative relationship here, but we do know that it goes on down through time because why? We find snakes repulsive Amen. by and large. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I, when I teach this to the children in chapel, you know, and never fails, some eight or nine year old boy will speak up and say, I'm not afraid of snakes, Pastor Wes. And I want, us, I want so bad to say, well, let me put a 12-inch garter snake in your book bag 
And when you unzip it and open it up, it comes out, and let's see if you're afraid of snakes. We find snakes repulsive. And I think that I can say this with confidence. I think that women, by and large, find snakes a bit more repulsive than men did. I think I, I, think I can say it. My mother, it didn't make any difference whether it was a six inch snake or a six foot snake, she would chop it into tiny little pieces with a hoe. She hated snakes. Women tend to find snakes more repulsive. So this goes back to the Garden of Eden. So getting back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, which we know this is Satan speaking, of course, the serpent of old, he said to the woman, he spoke to the woman. We do know that Eve was not shocked that a serpent spoke to her. Some people, some doubters say, what are you talking about? You know, what's about talking here? Talking snakes? I mean, wouldn't Eve be surprised at that? Well, we don't understand all of this, but we do know that indeed she knew because Adam had named the serpent and she was familiar with the serpent that Satan took this form of. So we do know this. And by the way, the serpent of old, many people wonder, where, what's the origins of evil? Have you ever thought about that? Where did evil come from? Because we know it exists, and it's amazing, our political leaders, you know, in, in, in the country, they don't talk much about evil at all, unless something, what, terrible and atrocious happens, and then they say, what, this is an act of evil. Well, acknowledging evil is acknowledging the Bible. Did you know that? Because Satan is the origin of evil. He was Lucifer, the bearer of light, the most beautiful, powerful archangel in heaven. But he grew very prideful. And he sought to be like God. And he thought he could be like God. So he rebelled against God with one third of the angelic host. And Jesus said he saw him cast out of heaven like lightning. And Lucifer became Satan. Which means adversary or enemy. Or also known as a devil. Which means accuser or slanderer. But we do know that he is the origin of of evil. Because his rebellion, his rebellion was evil. Trying to be like God and usurp God's authority in his throne. And God cast him out of heaven with one third of the angelic host, which we now know are demons, fallen angels. This is a reality. But what about the origin of sin? Where did sin come from? We don't hear much about sin in our society anymore. When's the last time that you heard the secular media talk about sin? They talk a lot about illnesses. So-and-so has an illness. So-and-so is what? Mentally incompetent. So-and-so had a bad upbringing or a harsh environment when they were younger. But they never talk about sin. Sin. What is sin? We talk about a lot in the church, don't we? We should. But I don't know. Maybe you don't hear too many sermons about it. Pastors really, by and large, in the 21st century in America, don't want to talk about sin because it disturbs people, makes people uncomfortable. Let's look at the definition of sin. Sin, the basic nuance of the word, look in your outline, means to miss the mark. Miss the mark. So imagine a bullseye up here in a pulpit. And let's say... That we all had some darts and we were trying to hit that bullseye from right here. And the bullseye was, let's say, three by three. But there was a little black dot in the middle of that bullseye just big enough that a Sharpie marker could make it. And you had to hit that little black dot dead center. And if you missed it by a quarter of an inch or you missed it by a foot, it did not matter. You missed the mark. This is sin. It's missing the mark of God's perfect standard. That's sin. And let me give you a little bit of theolo theological definition here. It's any violation of the moral, oral, or written law of God. Any violation? So when, when Romans 3.23 says, all that sin and what? Fallen short of the glory of God. Do you see we missed the mark? We have violated God's what? Moral, oral, or written law. Now we know about the written law is what? The Ten Commandments. The law in the Old Testament. The Old Testament written law. We know the Ten, hopefully you know the Ten Commandments. But Jesus what? 
He fulfilled the law. So when he came to earth and began teaching, he what? Gave us the moral law. The law behind the written law. And oh boy, how do you think that went over? The scribes and the Pharisees and the religious rulers, they hated Jesus for doing this. Because he what? He blew up their whole little world that they had created. He destroyed their self-righteousness. Because they had, they had obedience to the written, the external law. They had it down packed. They added to it. They even said you could only take so many steps on the Sabbath. You had to count the steps that you took. You couldn't exceed a certain amount. And then Jesus came along. And he said things like this. You have heard it, it was said. You shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, any man that looketh at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery where? In his heart. And then he said things like this. You Pharisees are like a bunch of whitewashed tombs. Outwardly you appear holy and unblemished, but inwardly you are full of wretchedness and filth and stench and dead man's bone. <coughs> that went over real well. No wonder they wanted to kill him. No wonder they wanted him to be away from him. Because he what? He gave them the moral law. He said it's not just about the external things, it's about what? The heart. It's what's in the heart that proceeds out of a man and defiles a man. And then we have what? The oral law of God. God said. And this is what we find in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Look in Genesis 2, 16 for a moment. And the Lord God commanded who? The man. That's Adam. That's very important. We're going to that here in the future. Hang with me there. The Lord God commanded the man. How did he command him? Saying. You see that? Saying. Oral. Speak. Saying. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. God gave what? Adam, one oral command. One. Of all the trees of the garden, you may what? Every tree you may freely eat. But of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. Because you will surely die. <coughs> One thing. Satan slithered into the garden with one object. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan was full of wrath. He is the origin of evil. He knew God was God. He knew what God had created. He knew God had created Adam and Eve. In his image, by the way, remember we learned that last week, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Satan knew this. Satan hated God, jealous of God, full of wrath and envy, and he slithered into the garden. He did not have the authority or the power to what? Destroy Adam and Eve outright, but he did have the authority to what? Tempt them to sin. Tempt them to sin. Because what, what we learn, sin is any violation of the moral, oral, or written law of God. And we know the rest of the story. I don't need to tell it to you because you know what it worked. He tempted Eve. Eve tempted Adam, and they both sinned. They both ate of the, fr of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they threw what? All of humanity and all of creation into what? Chaos. And they sinned, and they what? Caused death and destruction. And Satan's ploy worked. Now you may be thinking, well, Pastor, I know all these things. What's your point with me? I mean, how does this apply to me? I know Adam and Eve sinned, and, and I know all about this, what you're getting ready to read here in Genesis chapter 3. What's this have to do with me? Well, I'm looking out at all of you. I believe the majority of you know. Jesus Christ as your Savior. I hope so. You profess Jesus Christ. You know what? Jesus Christ came to save you from what? Sin. Right? What does the Bible say? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So you know Jesus Christ's whole purpose of coming was what? 
to bear witness to the truth. And the truth is, we need a Redeemer. We need a Savior. We need someone what? Who would substitute Himself, who was sinless, to die for our sins so that we could be freed from the penalty of sin. You heard that. You know that. We are freed from the penalty of sin through faith in Jesus Christ. That's basic foundational Christian knowledge. But did you know this? Christian, Jesus Christ also died upon the cross and dwells within us and the Holy Spirit dwells within us to what? Free us from the power of sin. Did you know you should not be under the power of sin or the bondage of sin? You say, where is that at? It's all through the Bible. But especially in Romans chapter 6. And I've just chosen one verse in that line. Look at this. Romans chapter 6 verse 14. What does the Bible say? For sin shall not have dominion over you, Christian. For you are not under law, but under what? Grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Some of you think I've heard this before. I know sin should not have dominion over me. Has you preached through all first John? I know what the Bible says. We are not to what? Habitually practice sin. We are not to be slaves of sin. We are what? It doesn't mean we're sinless. The Bible doesn't say we're sinless. But what? We never ever become slaves of sin because we do not practice sin. It doesn't become a lifestyle to us. So you think, and I know this, here we go again, but God knows I'm still struggling. God knows, and I know, there is sin in my life that I just can't seem to what? Overcome. And I feel like I have what? I'm, I'm a slave to it. I'm under the dominion of sin. But I know that the Holy Spirit dwells within me. And if God's Holy Spirit dwells within me, then what? I have died to sin. And how could I who have died to sin live any, live any longer in it? That's what Romans chapter 16. What's wrong? What's wrong? I got some good news for you. There's a weapon. A weapon that the Holy Spirit has given us. That far, far too many Christians do not use. And if they do use it, they don't use it very well. That weapon is none other than the sword of the Spirit. Do you know what the sword of the Spirit is? Ephesians chapter 6, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. How well do you use the Word? How well do you use the sword? <coughs> Jesus used it well. <coughs> Jesus used it well. Because Satan tempted him just like he did Eve. Temptation of the wilderness. Remember that? You look. Jesus what? All three times when he was tempted by Satan. He did not die all the Satan. Here is the Son of God. <coughs> God in the flesh. All the authority, what? Never argued, never debated with Satan. He what? Simply said, it is written. It is written. It is written. Three different times. You know where he quoted from? The Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. It is written. It is written. It is written. The only other words he ever said to Satan, if you look in Matthew chapter 4, simply this. Away with you, Satan. And then he said, it is written. Away with you, Satan. That's the only four words the Lord Jesus Christ had. Jesus Christ used what? The sword of the Spirit, the word of God, effectively against Satan. And what does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 4? The devil what? The devil fled from him. Eve did not use the sword of the Spirit very well. Did you know that? Eve did not use the sword of God's word very well. We're going to learn that this morning. And Christian, if you want to be free from the bondage of sin, you have to learn to use the word of God. 
Because that's why the Holy Spirit is given to us. And you have to be aware of your adversary's tactics. Because the Bible says that we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Did you know that? First Corinthians says we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. But many Christians are. They don't know how he works. They don't know what he does. And they certainly don't know the word of God to what? Fend off his attacks. And they stay in the bondage of sin. They are saved from the penalty of sin, but yet what? Sin seems to always overpower them and they are never free. Does God want this? Let's stand and read from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Please stand in honor of God's word as I read the text. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, God, help us to understand these verses, these five verses, your holy word. Because, oh, God, in these verses contains so much truth. In these verses, we see the strategy of our enemy. In these verses, we see the power of your word. In these verses, we see the warning not to be like Eve, to learn from her mistakes and combat the evil one. Oh God, this is relevant to us because Lord, we have an adversary and he is roaring, he's, a, he's like a roaring lion, he is prowling about the whole earth seeking whom he may what? Devour. Lord, we must resist him standing strong in the faith, secure in the word of God. Oh Lord, please use me as your vessel now to proclaim your truth and open up the ears and the minds and the hearts and souls of your people. Sanctify us now, Almighty God. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The servant had a strategy. And it worked. It worked. But it doesn't have to work on you. It doesn't have to work on me. Let's learn from the strategy. Point number one, the serpent of old challenged the authority. The authority, feel that in, of God's word. The serpent of old challenged the authority of God's word. He started out by saying, did you notice these first four words that he said? Has God indeed said has God indeed said this to Eve? What was Satan saying? Did you hear it from the lips of God himself? Eve did not, because we learned in 2.16 what? The Lord God commanded the man. He gave the commandment to Adam before Eve was born. So who told Eve the commandment of God Adam did? So what is Eve doing? She's casting down right away. Has God indeed said this? You sure you got this right, Eve? Maybe you heard this from Adam. But maybe Adam what? Maybe Adam didn't understand correctly. Has God indeed said this? So he still tries this strategy again and again, does he not? With Christians today, has God indeed said this? Is that indeed? Did you get it right? Are you sure? How do we know that we have what? The Word of God in our English Bibles has been translated correctly. After all, it was written in the Hebrew and the Greek, right? Has God indeed said this? Are you sure you're understanding it right? And then we hear things like this all the time. That's your interpretation of it. You ever heard anybody say that? Yeah. God says, oh yeah. That's your interpretation. Oh really? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
He said, no one comes to the Father except through Him. Oh, well, that's just your interpretation. He will say that all the time. Satan's first line of attack works a lot. That's your interpretation. Because why? It's all subjective, right? Wes Belcher's interpretation of Scripture may be different than Gary Tiller's. Gary's may be different than Rod Smith's. And all and all it goes, because what? In this world, in America today, we can't know truth at all. That's your interpretation. But that's not my interpretation. So you take your interpretation. You do whatever you want to with it. I'll keep my interpretation. You live your life. I'll live mine. Let's leave it all up. It works. Sadly, it works. <laughs> but we know that's not true. There is a right interpretation of Scripture. Scripture is never of any what? Private interpretation. Did you know that? It's never of any private interpretation. God meant what He said. Let me say that again. God meant what He said. And we can know the right interpretation of Scripture. But it is not of any private interpretation. <laughs> And you hear people say this word. Does this, sound, does this sound familiar to you? What this means to me. Oh, I pray if you've ever said that about a passage of Scripture, you would repent of that and you would never say that again. What this means to me. We do that all the time. I've heard Christians say that. We're studying a passage of Scripture. Well, what this means to me is... And then they go off and you're like... People sitting around but nobody wants to say anything because you know, everybody wants to be polite. Nobody wants to say anything but people are thinking, what in the world? Where are they going with this? Where do they get this from? What this means to me? It's what? It's the culture we live in today. Now don't get me wrong. Can God's word and does God's word speak where you're at? Yes. Can we go to God's word for what? Comfort, edification, correction, knowledge? Yes. Does God speak into your individual problems through his word? Yes. But his word is truth. <coughs> And we cannot say we got a private interpretation or what this means to me is this. We go off on some tangent. That really makes no sense at all. But has God indeed said works? And it worked with Eve. Has God indeed said? And then notice what Satan does. He pours it all. Look at this in verse 1. Has God indeed said, Eve, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now you look at that sentence. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And you think, yeah, what's the big deal about that? All right, you look at verse 16 of chapter 2. Look at 2.16. Look what God really said. Now note this. Look at 2.16. The Lord God commanded a man, saying, this is what God really said. Of every tree of the garden you may what? Freely. And then Satan, what? He twists that and he says, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Do you realize what he did? He put the word what? Not. A negative at the beginning of the sentence. Do you see that? You shall not eat of every tree. You know what he was saying? You know what he heard? God doesn't want you eating of every tree, right? And God said what? Of every tree you may freely eat. You see what God said? Of every tree you may what? Freely eat. And Satan comes along and he says, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Is that right, Eve? Did you hear that correctly? Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What's Eve here and here? A negative. God is what? He is abusing his authority. God is being unusually what? And unfairly what? Unjust and holding out on you. God doesn't want you to freely eat of every tree. No, God said what? I mean, is this right? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I want to ask you, did it work? Well, obviously it did. Look at you at verse 2. How did he respond? She didn't handle Scripture correctly because she said right away, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But note this, Eve left out the words every and what? Freely. She left out the words every and freely. Satan's tactics were already working in her mind and in her heart. She subtracted from the Word of God what? Twice. She subtracted from the Word of God. Do people want to subtract from the Word of God all the time today? 
All the time. All the time. Then look at verse 3. <coughs> she repeats this. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the where? Midst of the garden. She misquoted God's word. Because God said what? Every tree you may freely. Verse 17 of chapter 2. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't refer to it as a tree in the midst of the garden. You say, what's the big deal about that? The big deal was, is Eve was speaking to evil face to face. And if she would have quoted the word of God correctly, maybe, just maybe, what? She would have changed her mind and realized the deception going on. But she misquoted the word of God. She said the tree in the midst of the garden instead of the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. If she would have quoted the word of God correctly, look, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God's word would have what? Awakened her conscience and realized, hey, I'm speaking to evil. And God said, don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of fruit and of good and evil instead of this tree in the midst of the garden. She misquoted God's word. And then she added to it. She said what? Nor shall you touch it. Maybe she heard this from Adam. Many theologians, they Adam added that, right? Don't eat of it, Eve. And you know what, Eve? Don't even touch it. Don't even touch it. She added to God's Word. Did that have a consequence? <coughs> yes, if you look down at chapter, at, in chapter 3, verse 6, look at this. Eve, what? She saw it was pleasant to the eyes. Uh, she saw it was a tree desire to make one wise. And she did what? In verse 6, she took of its fruit. She took of it. She what? She touched it first. Now, what do you think was going on in Eve's mind at this point? When she touched that fruit, do you think? Maybe she was thinking, well, I touched it, and I didn't die. I'm touching it, I didn't die. So, I uh, don't think I'll die when I what? <clears throat> See? Don't add to God's Word. Don't add to God's Word. Now, I want to ask you something. How do we take away <coughs> from God's Word? I'm talking about professing Christians church. How do we take away from God? How can we count the ways? I'll tell you the most, the most disturbing things I've heard. True story. I'm not embellishing this. I'm not making this up. Southern Baptist Church in Virginia. 1999. 1999. 20 years ago. 1999. Had a basketball court. Boys who come from the neighborhood play basketball. The pastor of this church, whom I know personally, who told me this story, the pastor of this church, a Southern Baptist church in Virginia, built a relationship with one young man, 11 years old, playing basketball with him. Led him to faith in Jesus Christ. He repented of his sins, led him to faith in Jesus Christ. The pastor was all excited. He told the deacons about it. I've led this young man to the Lord. And I want to baptize him next Sunday. You know what three of the deacons said? No. You can't. I said, what? His faith is sincere. I led the Lord. He, re he repented. I know his faith is real. What do you mean I can't baptize him? Why can't I baptize him? Because he's black. Some of you are kind of gasping in disbelief. True story. True story. These three deacons of a Southern Baptist said, You cannot baptize this young man 11 years old because he's black. Did the pastor do it anyways? You betcha. You betcha. He did it anyways. The majority of the church was appalled. But those three men, they missed something, didn't they? Don't? What's John 3.16 say? You know. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That. I like the King James too. Whomsoever. The New King James says, Whoever believeth in Him shall what? Never perish and have everlasting. Does whoever cover every problem? You say, I would never do anything like that. I hope not, church. <laughs> that would be awful, would it not? I don't think any of you here 
would ever even want to go down that road. But I do want to ask you this. I mentioned two weeks ago that I prayed for politicians. And I said, I even pray for Nancy Pelosi. Y'all got a big kick out of that. <laughs> well, I didn't clarify this, but let me go ahead and clarify it. I pray, I pray for Donald Trump, too. Because you know what? God is no respecter of person. You know what I pray for Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump and all politicians? I pray for their salvation. I pray for their salvation. Some of you are maybe risking a little bit depending upon which side of the aisle you're on, you know. Well, you can't judge. You don't know if they're saying or not. They claim to know God. They believe in God. You know what James chapter 2 says? You believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. But do you not know, old man, that faith without works is... Say it loud, church. Faith without works is... Dead. Jesus said you'll know them by their <coughs> fruits. Do you see any fruit of salvation in any of our political leaders? Not? So what should we be praying for them? And you may be thinking, oh, are politicians whosoever's? Maybe they're a whatever. <laughs> no, they're not a whatever. They're a whosoever. They're people. <laughs> and they need what? They need the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. Do they not? They need salvation. Church, if we ever want to make a change in Washington, the best and most important thing we can be praying for is what? Salvation of our leaders. Because if we know God's Word, what do we know? Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. Could we use some new creations? <laughs> you all know what happened with Virginia, right? Do I need to go into that? I had a brother ask, her, are you, are you going to go in? I said, I don't know if the Lord leads. Well, you know what? He's leading me this. He's leading me here. We need to pray for Ralph. That's right. We need to pray for our leaders and pray for their what? <coughs> Salvation. That they will become new creations and they would what? Bear fruits worthy of repentance because we need that. And you know what burdens me and what God has convicted me of? Because you know what? I can do so much better on this and so can you. But what God has convicted me of, and it's true, think about this. If every born-again Christian in America, every believer in America, would what? Pray, spend half the time that they do complaining and fussing that we do about our leaders. If we would spend half that time in praying for their what? <laughs> Salvation. What would God do? Is that an ouch? Yeah, that's an ouch for me. Because I confess, number one, I spend a whole lot more time complaining and fussing than I do praying. And you probably do too. But imagine if every believer in America would be praying for the salvation of their leadership in Washington. What God would do. Don't subtract from the Word of God. And don't misquote it. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but let me just say this. There are too many English Bible translations. There are too many English Bible translations. Way too many. You know why? Because there's gold in them, their heels. It's money involved. We have too many. The church should have stopped and said enough is enough in probably the 1980s. But now there's a new translation coming out all the time. And some of them paraphrase the Word of God. You say, Pastor, you're going to make some recommendations? Yes. Stick with good word-for-word -word translations. Word-for-word, -word, not thought-for-thought. -thought. Stay away from, and if you have this translation, I'm sorry. Stay away from the translation, the message. It's too loose. It's a paraphrase. Watch out for that. Stick to the King James. You don't like the new King, the King James? Use what my favorite is, what I preach from. The New King James. Good word for word translation. New American Standard. If 
you want to go to a happy medium, stay with the Holman Christian Standard Bible, HCSB. These are good translations. But watch out, because there's too many translations. And you know what many Christian authors do? And I might step on some toes, but I'll go ahead and say this. Rick Warren is one of the worst. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, used no less than 15 different Bible translations. Why? Because he could pick out each translation, what the Word of God said, and he said what? This proves my point in each chapter. God is going to hold His people accountable. He holds us accountable to how we handle His Word. Don't misquote it. Don't misquote it. Yes, we have our English translations. The Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek, Aramaic in some places. You all know that. Every translation, what? Falls a little short from the original language. But we have some really good English translations out there to use them. Use them. You say, that's too hard for me to understand? Keep studying it. Don't give up. Don't misquote the Word of God. Because God will hold us accountable for that. And finally, don't ever add to it. Don't ever add to it. One of the most terrible examples I give you of this, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I had a good friend named Chris. Chris was seeking God. He was, he was looking into God's Word. His father was a pastor. But his father believed and taught Chris this, was a Pentecostal pastor, and said, Chris, you are not saved until you speak in tongues. Because speaking in tongues gives evidence that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. So you are not saved until you speak in tongues. And I watched my good friend Chris struggle with this through 7th grade, through 8th grade, through ninth grade. And I watched him slowly sink into what? The depths of despair and despondency by the time he was in 10th grade. And he gave up. Because I'm never going to be able to speak in tongues. I can't fake it. I can't manufacture it. I give up. And I watched him slide into alcohol and drug abuse and everything. It was a terrible thing. All because what? Somebody added to the Word of God. What's the Word of God say? We are saved by grace through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. By repenting of our sins and turning to Him in faith. And when a believer does that, when a person does that, the Holy Spirit does come to dwell within them. But speaking in tongues is what? Not, not required to show and evidence your salvation. The fruit of the Spirit is... If you are saved, you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit found in the Galatians chapter 5. You know that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. That's how we know we are saved and we obey the commandments of God. Oh, I wish, I wish when I was a young man, I wish that I would have known the Word of God even half as much as I do now. I could have made you help Chris. Could you help him? Could you help a friend today that comes to you with that question? Would you know where to turn? Would you know where to turn? Don't answer the word of God. And I know I've got to get going. Point number two. And don't worry, point two and three is going to go back with you. Look at this. The serpent of old challenged the accuracy, the accuracy of God's word. Satan loves to do that. Not only the authority, but the accuracy. He said to Eve, what? You will not surely I. He, Satan specifies, he, he, he specializes in half truths. He loves human half truths. You won't surely die. Eve did not die physically immediately when she took the fruit day, did she? No. But you know what? Her and Adam died a little bit every day. How old did Adam live to be? 930 years old. Would you have known that if it wasn't on the outline? So in Genesis chapter 5, Adam lived a long life. Did he not? Wow, 930 years. How is that possible? What about Methuselah? He lived to be 969, I believe. Wow, that's a long life. You know why? Because the effects of the fall and the effects of sin had not begun to what? Immediately take place. But it was coming. That's why we know when Abraham, he lived to be what? 180? Am I right? 
180 years old. Big difference, right? We say Adam lived a long life. He lived to be 930 years old. But you know what? Adam couldn't live forever. What's 930 years compared to forever? Because why? The tree of life was in the garden. I want to ask you this. Could Adam and Eve, could Adam and Eve be to the tree of life? Some of you are like, I don't know about that. Is that a true question? No, that's not true. 16, chapter 2. What did God say? Of every tree of the garden, you may what? Freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not. Adam and, have, Adam and Eve had access to the tree of life. They could what? Eat of it and live. And live and live and live and live. That's the reason God had to drive them out of the garden. Because what? Lest the man should take and reach for the tree of life. And eat and live forever. In his mercy, God says, you got to go. And he barred access to the tree of life. Adam could live forever. What's 930 years? But you know what happened to those 930 years? Adam saw a lot. He had sons and daughters, grandchildren, great grand. He had. He saw what? His descendants. But he also saw his oldest son Cain murder Abel. Did he not? How much do you think it grieved Adam and Eve to see their descendants what turning away from God and turning more and more to idolatry and sin? Wickedness. And we know by the time Noah, by the time Noah's time, what? The whole earth was filled with wickedness. How long? Adam lived 930 years. Don't you think he saw? He saw much of that. And Adam and Eve, what? As they aged, they what? Like all of us, they realized they were dying. And I hate to tell you this, I know this sounds morbid, but looking at your faces, I think all of you are over the age of 21. Most of you here, you know what? We're all dying. I hate to tell you that, but that's the truth. We're dying. But Satan said what? You will not surely die. <clears throat> oh, you will surely die. You will surely die. So Satan challenges the authority of God's word and the accuracy of God's word. All the time. And then he moves to this mode of attack. Notice he changes things here. Look at point three of the outline. The serpent of old makes a direct accusation. Feel that an accusation against the Lord God himself. Satan changes his tactics. He goes from challenging the authority of God, the Word of God, and the accuracy of the Word of God to what? Making a direct accusation against the Lord God himself. When he says, verse 5, For God knows... That in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. What was he saying to Eve? He was saying this. God is certainly holding something from you. Eve, you can be like God. Eve, God is holding out on you. Don't you know you can be like God? You can know what? The difference between good and evil. Was that a half-truth? Adam and Eve would know the difference between good and evil. But they would not be like God. Think about this, church. Does God know the difference between good and evil? Yeah. Well, what does the Bible say in James? God is not tempted by evil. Nor can He tempt anyone by evil. Because why? God is holy. God is good. And God is God. What Satan didn't tell Eve is that you and Adam, if you eat of this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will know the difference. But instead of being able to what? Choose what is good. You will only be able to choose what is evil. Because you are not like God. <coughs> what did Paul say in Romans chapter 7? You ever feel like Paul? The good that I want to do I don't find in myself any ability to do it. But the evil, the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. You see Satan's deception? You can be like God, no difference between good and evil. He didn't tell him the rest of the story. Did he? You know why? Because Jesus said, Satan is a liar. He was a murderer from the beginning. 
And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources because he is a liar and the father of all lies. That's our adversary. That's why he is known as an accuser. And look at this. The devil makes accusations against God to us. You ever heard this thing? Boy, if this is what it's like to be a child of God, you'd have been better off just being an enemy of God, right? But is this blessings? Is this what? Is this what Jesus meant by love and life? You ever hear things like that? Am I the wrong one? <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Where, where's this stuff coming from? Where's the accusations against God coming from? Where's the doubt? Where's the fear? Where's all this stuff coming from? From the accuser. Because you know what he does? He accuses God to us. Have you ever believed any of that garbage? Say, sometimes I do. Oh, Sometimes we may for a day or two. But don't let it go on. Cling to the Word of God. God is good. And His mercy endures forever. He will not always cast off. But He will restore. Know the Word of God. Because Satan accuses God to us all the time. And you know what else? He accuses us to God. Did you know Satan accuses you to God all the time? That's what the Scripture says. Satan is always accusing you. Naming you by name, just like he did Job, saying, hey, you know what West thought? You know how West doubted you? Accusing me and you to God all the time. And you know what else? He accuses us to others and others to us. You ever heard any accusations? Coming into your head about your brothers and sisters in Christ, about your spouse, about your husband, your wife, your children, your parents. All these accusations. That's what Satan does. He slanders, he accuses. That's, that's who he is. Because his name literally means false accuser or slander. So I want to ask you, do we have any hope of defense against this servant of the Lord? Do we have any hope? Yes, we do. Is it in our own strength? Oh. I hate to tell you this, but Adam and Eve, they were a lot stronger and smarter and wiser than we'll ever be in our fallen state. Any other human being? They were no match. No match for Satan. Our only hope is in the Lord. Is in the Lord. And our only hope is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And something else. How we overcome Satan? How can we overcome the serpent? Turn your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. I want you to see this. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. <clears throat> Revelation 12, 7. This is yet to come. By the way, Revelation 12, 7. This is going to happen, happen near the tribulation period. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Look at verse 8. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, wasn't Satan cast out? Jesus said he saw him descend like lightning. Yes, but remember the book of Job? Satan appeared before God, so Satan and his angels do still have access. It doesn't mean that they what? That they dwell as holy angels anymore, but they do have access to heaven. But a time will come in the future when they will be cast out. Verse 9, so the great dragon was what? Cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now look at verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice say in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night. 
has been cast down. That's right. Satan accuses you and me before our God, what? Day and night. But there will come a day when he won't be able to do it anymore. Amen? Hallelujah for that. He's going to be cast down. But how did we overcome him? How did we overcome him? Look at verse 11. And they, the saints, they, the saints, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. If Satan accuses us before God night and day, saints, listen, if Satan accuses us before God night and day, we need an advocate. Do we not? We need somebody to intercede for us. Do we have that person? Our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, lives, lives to make intercession for us. Night and day. <coughs> he lives to make intercession for us. How? By His blood. That He shed once and for all. That's the reason the Bible says what? We overcome Him by the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way. <coughs> we have to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. By the blood of the Lamb. You have to have an advocate. You have to have an intercessor. Because Satan is accusing you before God, bringing charges that are what? Are true, and he knows it to be true. And God knows it to be true, indeed, that you have sinned. Do you have an intercessor? I hope you do. I hope you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Lamb. But secondly, look how else we overcome Satan. What does the Bible say? The word, the word of their testimony. Christian, do you have a word of testimony? Well, uh, what's that? What's the word of testimony? They did not what? Love their lives to the death? You have a word of testimony. If your life is built on the testimony of the word of God. <coughs> You have a word of testimony. If your testimony is built on the word of God. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus told the devil, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Think about that. We don't, we don't live by bread alone. But we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this word in Deuteronomy chapter 8 is not there just to be there. Jesus did not quote it because it sounded good. It is truth. It is truth. We don't live by bread alone, but our very lives depend upon what? What comes forth from the mouth of God, the word of God. How well do you know it? How well do you know it? When Satan comes against you with his challenges and his accusations, do you fumble? Do you drop your sword? Is it a bit rusty? Do you know how to handle it? I think we could all say, including me, we can do a whole lot better. Church, can we do a whole lot better? You see, this isn't a message about trying to 
guilty we into studying the Word of God. It's like, yeah, I know, Pastor, I need to lose some weight, and I need to stop eating so much ice cream, and I, I need to get some more exercise, and I know I need to read the Bible too. That's what many people look at. I know I need to do it, but I just don't like it. It's hard. It's hard. And I understand a lot of it. How much scripture have you memorized? How much scripture have you memorized? Do you commit to memory? What's the Bible say? Your word I have hidden. Where at? My heart. You know the purpose of doing that? You say, all oh, is it to impress my friends? <laughs> See, it's, this is not meant to make you feel guilty. What God wants you to know is, you know what? Your survival, your spiritual life depends upon using and knowing and obeying the what? The Word of God. And although we live in an age where information is everywhere, as Mike said, we got too many Bible translations and there are study aids and helps and you can get on the internet and you can... We still don't want to do that, do we? I'm going to be starting in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 next Sunday, Lord. Lord. I wonder... When any of you study verses 6 through, say, 13, will you get a head start on that? You say, I don't know where to start. Start with Genesis 6, Genesis 3, 6 through 13. Read it. Study it. Write down some questions. What does this mean? I don't understand. Get in the Word of God yourself. Because I really don't want to say this in closing. But I'm afraid I know it to be true. Because I've learned a little bit about people over the years. And I'm afraid and I fear that at least, at least half of you, at least half of you here in the sanctuary this morning, you haven't opened the Word of God since last Sunday. You haven't opened the Word of God and read it since last time. I don't know that for sure, but I fear it to be happening. How are we going to overcome the evil one? How are we going to please God? How are we going to overcome sin in our lives that sin would not have power control over? How are we going to do that? <coughs> Study to show yourselves approved. So that you will not be ashamed when you stand before your Lord and Master. Because <coughs> I don't want to ever be ashamed when I stand, stand before God's people and open up His Word and say, Well, Lord, I kind of winged it. I didn't really study it that much. You know, I only had an hour this week. I wouldn't have wanted that'd be terrible. Stand before the Lord and explain to him why I never studied for a message. But do you, as God's people, think the Lord's just going to say, Oh, it's okay. Don't crack your Bibles, you know, just listen to the preacher. Just get it all on Sunday morning. Father, thank you, Lord, for these truths that we have discovered, Lord, in Genesis chapter 3. Lord, we are more knowledgeable, I pray. We are not ignorant of the evil ones, the devils, the slanderer, our enemy, our adversary, the servant of old. We're not ignorant of his devices. And Lord, we see what he did to Eve. We see how he challenged the authority and the accuracy of your, God, of your word and then went on to just accuse you the God of heaven and earth before you. And He does the same thing all the time. <laughs> Why should He change His strategy when it works so well? Almighty God, I pray Your people have been sanctified by Your truth today. Lord, I pray they would make a renewed commitment to study your truth, to hide it in their heart, to obey it, to do it, and to overcome, to overcome the evil one.
Oh, Lord, I know. Maybe not a lot of people will come forward. There may be some here in a moment. But saint, brother, sister in Christ, can you say you have overcome the serpent of old by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony? Can you say that? Do you have that assurance? If you do not, cry out to God now. Ask for His mercy. If you don't have the blood of the Lamb, what do you have? The blood's the only thing that can cleanse you of your sin. If you don't have Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. You can't go to the Father. For Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Why don't you repent of your sin and turn to faith in Jesus Christ and make Him the Lord of your life. Stop messing around. Make Him the Lord. Submit to His Lordship now. Right now. You are fearful of your testimony. What testimony do you have? <coughs> you need to understand your testimony should be that you what? You heard and you obeyed. You were a doer of the word. Jesus said, you must obey my commandments. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? <coughs> obey God. Learn His commandments and do them. That's your testimony. Because His Word makes clear. Jesus said, Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. We get that from the Word of God. Jesus said that. That's the Word of our testimony. How well we know the Word of God. Make a renewed commitment today to learn and obey His Word. Thank you, God, for speaking to your people. We're going to have a very brief invitation. If anyone needs to come, oh Lord, I pray, give the courage to draw them. Just come and kneel at the altar and pray. If you've touched their heart with something that your word has declared, give them the courage to help. May your will be done, oh God, on earth and in this church and in our lives, just as it is in heaven. Amen.